Yes, uh, certainly people are living longer with the antiretroviral agents that we currently use. Uh, if somebody is to get HIV today, their longevity would be the same uh, as somebody who does not have HIV. So that's the impact uh, on uh, survival that these antiretroviral agents have uh, made. However, people should not take it for granted that their life expectancy would be same um, uh, and uh, play, play around with uh, issues and concerns of adherence and compliance to regular therapy with the antiretroviral agents. They are also like, they are like any other um, uh, uninfected individual prone to develop the traditional uh, disorders as you advance in age. Like for example, they can have heart disease, they can have diabetes, they can have bone loss and develop fractures, they can have problems related to obesity, smoking, alcohol use, all of which can affect the longevity. So one has to be careful and ensure that all these morbidities of the heart, the kidney, the endocrine organs are minimized. HIV, the virus per se, as we understand today, causes some amount of inflammation or it stimulates the immune system to develop uh, inflammatory uh, markers, which has got a damaging effect on the various cells of the body. The damaging effect, we say it is due to the oxidative stress that is produced by these um, by these uh, various uh, transmitters or various um, biological agents that are being secreted in the body. Secondly, chronic immunosuppression also um, um, results in this activation. So you have got oxidative stress plus immunosuppression which can result in having an accelerated aging process. When we say accelerated, accelerating aging process means a premature aging process. Therefore, a person who is likely to get uh, say heart disease at the age of 60 without HIV can get it at an earlier age of 50. Therefore, they must take precautionary measures and ensure that the aging process is either retarded or it is not aggravated. Example, what can they do? If they've got diabetes, control it. If they've got hypertension, control it. If they are a smoker, stop smoking. If they, are a, um, uh, they do not have any physical activity, start on some physical activity. If they are obese, reduce the weight. If they've got high cholesterol, control the cholesterol. If they, are, if they have got a high triglycerides and, uh, and others, minimize the uh, effect of these lipids. All these can result in oxidase, for further oxidative stresses uh, upon the blood vessels, particularly the endothelial cells, which are very important in order to preserve the, um, uh, the vascularity to the different tissues of the body. Similarly, the, the aging, as age advances, you have these cells in the brain dying out. It may be due to vascular causes, but the virus itself produces some amount of affectation through the oxidative stresses, acts on the dendrites, these are all the, and the synapses, these are all the connecting uh, parts of the brain, and uh, which eventually leads to death, premature death of the brain cells. Therefore, these people might lose their mind in terms of cognition, the, you know, their inability to understand, inability to uh, comprehend, and uh, memory lapses, all of these may occur. The antiretroviral drugs do not impact uh, this cell, the, um, uh, these, uh, F uh, the, these uh, cellular changes mm -hmm. simply because they do not cross the blood-brain barrier as well as in other tissues of the body. So it is possible that uh, we need to look, have a further research and look into why the brain cells may degenerate fast, a little faster or age a little faster than the general population. 
We, some of these drugs, antiretroviral drugs, have also got compounding effects on uh, um, the metabolic uh, aspects. Like, for example, um, the, uh, the they can they can have the adiposity, that is the excess fat deposits, and uh, excess adiposity means excess fat cells, which means excess metabolic, uh, you know. Uh, you know um, uh, dyslipidemias as we call it and which can have effect in the changes in the endothelial cells. Then of course drug interactions which um, uh, you know some of them are seen with some of these fat lowering agents but but with agents to decrease the blood sugars <coughs> agents to decrease the blood pressure we don't have too much of a problem uh, with that. So by and large I would say that we've got enough drugs to combat the aging process. Can we, we can retard it, but can we reverse it? That's a big question. We certainly can retard it or at least minimize the effects of accelerated aging. But certain other organs age, eyes, the eyes will age, cataract, should be, you should be able to do the surgery. Kidneys will have a little uh, greater uh, um, uh, affectation, but of course the antiretroviral drugs will minimize the damage to the kidney and uh, you know various organs and uh, anemia will be another problem in the elderly nutrition will be a problem in the elderly because elderly are prone to become frail they lose muscle so if they do exercise their muscle mass should be built up can be built up so you don't lose muscle we in india tend to lose muscle because we simply do not do uh, let's say exercise and build up the muscle mass. We build up our fat mass, but not the muscle mass. So we certainly have to impress on our people that uh, you've got to do, you know, uh, uh, exercises to improve the strength of the upper body as well. Merely walking will give you. <coughs> I'm not. <coughs> I, I'm not talking about athletic conditioning. I'm talking, and or nor am I talking about endurance building. I'm talking about simple maintenance of a muscle mass that would be that would enable us to maintain balance and prevent falls as well as improve the bone strength by having a physical activity yes, yeah. in the elderly <coughs> there is also what we call immunosenescence immunosenescence means that either our cells are becoming older when we talk about the cells that become older they become less responsive to the stimulation of various antigens now antigens are parts of the wall of organisms that come into the body now for example pneumococcus is an infection that can occur in the elderly it can occur, it is it's a disaster when it occurs in age group less than 5 and in the age group above 60 65 so in these two groups we can certainly prevent the effect of the streptococcus pneumonia so therefore vaccinations are available for for the elderly but when does it begin? Immunosenescence, does it begin at the age of 40, 45, 50, 55, 60? It's very difficult, it's arbitrary. But we say that it begins from the age of 50. So you, if, even if I say it begins at 40 or 45, the, the vaccines will have to stimulate the cells, we call it as the lymphocytes, to make the Immuno, um, uh, and in the immuno, um, the immunoglob, the let's say the antibodies. The antibodies neutralize the bacteria that come into the body. So it has to be done at a time when these lymphocytes are functional. So when does it begin to lose its function qualitatively? 55, 60, 65. So we have a ballpark figure of greater than 60 greater than 65 make sure that they get immunized at that age if you immunize them at that age there will the body will be able to mount a response specifically against these organisms that are getting into the body 
And several of these which can be done, one is pneumococcus, yes. pneumococcal pneumonia, second is influenza, third of course is uh, we all take our injections for rabies if you are bitten by a rabid uh, dog, tetanus toxoid, diphtheria, acellular pertussis, and uh, we ha I have not begun giving them, you know, in um, uh, polio vaccine, intramuscular polio vaccine, and uh, particularly people who travel to for Hajj, people who travel to crowded places, and then the chances of um, uh, admixture of bacteria are there in the respiratory system. So I would recommend that they take a pneumococcal vaccine for such uh, visits. Cholera vaccine, hepatitis A vaccine, um, uh, chickenpox vaccine or so called and uh, varicella zoster vaccine. Now varicella zoster doesn't kill you but it produces that herpes zoster which is a painful condition. It's, um, uh, it's, um, um, by taking that vaccine you can prevent the effect of varis, um, of the so called herpes zoster. But it is expensive so I have not begun advising my people to take that. But if a younger person should, uh, who's an immunocompromised person, uh, who's had a organ transplantation and things like that, we don't want him to. Uh, he's already on immunosuppressing drugs. We don't want him to have a problem, so we might consider giving him herpes, uh, the so-called zoster vaccine. But however, the other vaccines they would have to take, and um, which means the influenza vaccine the uh, uh, elderly elderly would have to take the influenza vaccine depending upon the season and the pneumococcal vaccine the um, uh, hepatitis b we don't really um, give the um, the non medical people we don't give the hepatitis b vaccine hepatitis a we believe that we would have all been uh, you know already had that hepatitis a by drinking water over these years as such Typhoid, I don't really believe in it so much as to give them typhoid, intramuscular uh, typhoid uh, vaccine. And um, the, um, uh, of course, uh, the other um, uh, childhood or vaccine preventable disease in the childhood, we don't give them mumps, measles or rubella vaccine. Uh, we don't, um, varicella zoster, I might give, varicella vaccine, I might give it for the uh, medical students, you know, school college going students or school going students simply because they cannot afford to lose two weeks from their uh, studies because uh, they are quarantined, they can't come to school or college and write the exam or the university. Um, hepatitis B for healthcare workers, hepatitis B for young children because um, we do not know where they might go and have a problem and uh, get an unsterile uh, needle uh, injection. So we give them the hepatitis B vaccination as well. The, um, uh, what people have to realize is that the human papilloma virus, which prevents uh, cancer of the cervix, has to be given to both boys and girls before they begin their first sexual encounter. Boys in particular, because they are the ones who are likely to transmit it to the uh, girls and girls would also um, require it so that they do not contract this human papilloma virus. So uh, we have got this quadrivalent vaccines in our country and uh, they are quite effective against preventing these cancers but now the world is looking forward to this nonovalent vaccine which can certainly prevent the development of enogenital cancers in the um, male as such and um, we can see elimination of ca uh, cancer cervix if there is a long term uh, vaccination program against the uh, herpes uh, against the human papilloma virus. We are seeing that the, a possibility prevention we have got enough. We have got all of the measures that are required for prevention starting from condom use right up to uh, treatment as prevention, testing and prevention, 
so that if you are tested if you are screened and tested sooner the chances of your um, um, transmitting the virus is less mm -hmm. so in such an instance we see a great potential to prevent new infection mm -hmm. the second thing that we are seeing here is that um, the survival as the survival um, benefit um, is uh, well uh, established by taking this antiretroviral drug, we are now able to focus on other diseases like hepatitis C, which has a greater um, um, you know, toll on the life of the uh, person who is HIV infected. So we are able to, and the cost of treatment for hepatitis C and, uh, um, can be brought down, but because you're getting a 95% cure in hepatitis C. And a large number, about 15 million people are there in the country with uh, hepatitis C. And there are only 3 million with HIV. So we see that uh, hepatitis C and HIV, which occur in a very high proportion of people with intravenous drug use, we can begin to have an impact of, um, of minimizing the spread of both by the, uh, by the use of ART as well as hepatitis C drugs. The third part um, that we are now beginning to sense is that a possibility of a cure is in sight. Now when I say <coughs> uh, cure, it means two types. One is sterilizing cure and the other one is a functional cure. Sterilizing cure when we have eliminated all remnants, all traces of the virus. Functional cure, we know that the virus is there but it's doing no harm. So we at least we understand the mechanism of wh why uh, this is happening because there are pharmacological sanctuaries. We have got cells which are latent and they don't come up to the surface, which is uh, you know where our antiretroviral drugs can act because our current antiretroviral drugs do not act upon the latent cells. So we have eliminated it from most parts of the body, but in these areas where we, our drugs cannot reach or where the cells are uh, um, uh, latently infected. In other words, the uh, drugs do not recognize these cells or the drugs are not able to penetrate and kill or the cells are not able to, the, um, the good cells that we have or the stimulated T cells that we have are not able to sense these uh, cells which are latent and not having actively multiplying. So we feel that uh, we may be on the breakthrough to look at ways and means of stimulating these latent cells and then as it comes up, you know, trying to eliminate them as well. Both through pharmacological means, searching and killing these latent cells through pharmacological means and maybe even through a vaccine, mm. uh, which is possible. So we feel, I mean, as I teach today, there are only two infectious disease conditions that cannot be cured. One is rabies and the other one is HIV. So um, we are on the, we, are, we are on the, it's possible probably in my lifetime, 20 years left <laughs> in, my, in my professional career. And I think we should be able to see it sometime. Amen.